I ended up moving to California in the beginning of 2006, and that was to work on my Hollywood movie project, Convergence. And after I got there, I noticed that within a relatively short time, there was this group on the internet that was starting to make waves called Project Camelot, and this was in the dawn of YouTube era. So they were starting to get out there, and they were starting to get pretty interesting. And at the same time, I was working with Richard C. Hoagland, who was the guy that had talked about the idea that there was a face-like mesa on Mars that actually has eyes on both sides, has a headdress around the top. It is really amazing if you've ever seen it. This does not at all look like a natural formation. And then just to the left of that face is what looks like a city of Egyptian-style pyramids, and then just to the south of that face is a very blatant five-sided pentagonal pyramid, but it's not a pure pentagon, it's a pentagon in the shape of the Vitruvian man, a human being with his arms and legs out. Clearly, again, suggesting humans were on Mars, humans built these ruins that are now completely trashed, and NASA is not willing to let us know about this. And by that point, we'd already heard from other insiders that Dr. Stephen Greer had gotten. In fact, there was a guy named A.H. in his book, who I later was able to meet, who had said that he had heard from NASA that they had much more elaborate information about the face and pyramids on Mars. They knew it was real. They knew it was an ancient civilization. That is a game changer. To find out that our civilization on Earth is not the first and that there may have been other civilizations that were more advanced than we were that died out. And we might, in fact, actually be, at least partly, descended from people that had lived on Mars before and that planet was no longer viable and they moved next door. So, at this point, I go to Richard C. Hoagland's conference in Joshua Tree, California, the same place that Contact in the Desert had been for the first five years. It's a beautiful campus, it's in the desert, and I had given a talk where I was describing my scientific research into DNA. At the end of the talk, this man comes up to me, follows me out, throws his arm around me, and says, you're about 85% correct. And I'm, I'm like, well, uh, what's the other 15%? He said, well, take me out to dinner and I'll tell you. It turns out that this guy, who we call Bruce, and it's again not his real name, was Richard C. Hoagland's top insider who had been feeding him lots and lots of intel for years, had been giving him leads on not only the face and pyramids on Mars, but glass shattered domes that were found on the moon, all kinds of weird structures on the moon. Bruce had told him where to look, what photo frames to ask NASA for, all kinds of really cool stuff. And I sat down with Bruce, we went to dinner, and he told me that he had worked for these same kind of defense contractors. He'd worked at S4, is what he called it, other people call it Area 51. One of the weird things that Bruce told me was that there was a dog on the base and they really loved this dog and when the dog died they had the ability to clone the dog and that each new cloned version remembered all the tricks and all the behavioral eccentricities that the dog before had. And that was one of the things he wanted to tell me about DNA science that he had understood. He also told me that he was affiliated with the guy who was the top man at NORAD watching the radars and that they had created a screening system to screen out all of these craft that were not supposed to see. So this guy was the air traffic controller at NORAD who saw the real radar that showed all kinds of stuff that the traditional radar that you would get at NORAD or that you'd get at the airport, you'll never actually see them. They are built to have, those shield, to have that shielded out so that it's not visible. And there was so much stuff. He was telling me over the years as time went by, in his understanding, we had been in craft that had traveled throughout our solar system, but he was told that we couldn't leave the solar system. And he was told that we hadn't really developed anything out in space that much. We'd just kind of gone around and looked at it, but we hadn't really landed and settled anywhere. So I trusted him, and I believed that was true, 
okay, well, yeah, we have some cool stuff. And so one of the really weird things was Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 is this chain of like nine major fragments that strike Jupiter in 1993. And at the exact time that they struck Jupiter, it was right down to the minute practically of the 25 year anniversary of the Apollo moon landings. And so that would suggest that somebody was out there with a craft and had precisely steered this comet chain to hit that planet, hoping, I guess, that it was going to blow up, that the hydrogen would ignite, because that's what you see at the end of Arthur C. Clarke's novel 2010, which is also the movie, where Jupiter blows up and then it becomes a new solar system and we can now inhabit these moons that were around Jupiter. So now I'm starting to think, well, yeah, that makes sense. Somebody could have had a spaceship and somebody could have actually moved that comet into position. And of course, all along I'd been thinking, if Roswell is real and we had interplanetary capable craft as early as 1947 and we'd started to really be able to engineer them by the 1950s, then absolutely we would have the ability to fly around, to take trips through space, through the solar system, all this interesting stuff. So that really opened me up. He never wanted to come forward, but he had a lot of information. One of the other things he told me was that the government, if you want to call it that, wants to control the cocaine business. And he described that there were very, very precise chemical markers that were put in the cocaine that told them where it had been manufactured, the date of its manufacture, uh, how long it had been since it's, it had been moved from place to place. That, so, so you're actually, the people who use cocaine are snorting a cocktail of chemicals that include these markers that are like basically an encyclopedia of the history of where it's been and what it's done. He didn't tell me how the chemicals were introduced. Probably they get zapped with some kind of energy beam as they go from point to point in their distribution system. But what he said was that by adding these chemical markers to the cocaine, and he was involved with this with Ronald Reagan and the whole Iran-Contra scandal, he was working with the administration during that time. He said that what this allowed them to do is they would periodically get cocaine and test it. And any cocaine that didn't have the right code, then they would hunt them down. And those people would be put out of business. So this was how they were able to control the cocaine business and make sure that all of the money from the sale and traffic of illicit drugs was going right back into these programs having to do with UFOs. So here's the guy who's literally working at Area 51 and making sure that the cocaine business works at the same time because that's where the money was coming from. And then I also heard from other insiders that the heroin business, same thing. Why was it after 9-11 that the first thing America does is invade Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, Iraq is oil money and Afghanistan is heroin money. And so this stuff starts to get really weird because you have insiders who have been working on these classified UFO related projects and at the same time they're also deeply involved in illicit businesses that generate large amounts of money. In 2018, President Trump announced the development of Space Force, the sixth branch of the U.S. military. To establish a Space Force. The President and the American public were completely unaware that it already existed. <laughs> We put together programs that went all the way out into the galaxy. 